you for this opportunity that we have to assemble this morning, both in person and online, and to have a time where we can be concerned about those that we know and offer up prayers on their behalf. We pray, Father, for Christine Turner as she is recovering at home, and we pray that that will be a painless and quick recovery for her. We pray for Robert Brindley as he is also at home recovering, and we pray, Father, that as he is recovering, he will have a great resolve and faith, as well as hopefully, Father, this will continue to help. We pray, Father, for Lisa Woods as she is in Vanderbilt. We pray, Father, that as she is facing a brain tumor and multiple decisions are up in the air at this very time, that the best decisions can be made possible. And we pray, Father, for her comfort and the best results. We pray, Father, for the entire group of people that meet here at East Hill. For all of us, Father, as we are facing this world, as we are facing a variety of things that are in our personal lives, as we are facing a number of things in our national lives, we pray, Father, that we will have a greater faith in you. And we pray, Father, that we will take the first steps in doing that in our personal lives and being more dependent on your word, not just when we are considered together and assembled together as a group. But we pray, Father, that every person that's here, every person that's home, and every person that has a part to do with East Hill, that every one of us on our own personal accord will strengthen our own faith by opening up your word and seeing the wonderful things that are in your word for us to see that you truly have our best interest inside of this world and inside of eternity. We pray, Father, a very special prayer on our nation. There is a lot of unrest in our nation. There is a lot of uncertainty in our nation. There's a lot of concern right now. We pray, Father, that as we see the coming weeks unfold, that we will have a greater resolve in you, that no matter what takes place, no matter what happens, we will look to you and know, Father, your kingdom will never be destroyed. We will look to you and know that we have a part in a work that is greater than any on this earth. And we will look to you in knowing that eternity, it's not that far away in the concept of time. We're thankful, Father, for the wonderful things that we can know in this life. We pray, Father, as we enter into our class that we will rid our minds of everything that's going on in this world and we will only focus on your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I do want to mention this as we get going this morning. This is for those that are here and for those that are online. I was, a couple of people asked me to mention this, so we'll go ahead and take just a moment this morning to mention this as we all kind of get settled in the auditorium. Uh, we do want you to know that every week, twice a week, the auditorium and the classrooms are all deep cleaned. Matter of fact, Dennis takes care of us in a broader spectrum than we've ever seen. Uh, we have purchased an industrial fogger and the certain cleaning chemicals that go along with that to both fog the auditorium, the classrooms, and any other location of which we meet in regard to our regular services. So that takes place as well as all the doors and any surfaces that are touched. They are cleaned on a regular basis. So a couple of people were asking about that, and that tells me that more than just the few that asked me had questions. So just rest assured that the building is cleaned thoroughly in between every service, and that will hopefully help all of us, both those that are here and those at home that are potentially considering coming back in person, to know that the building is cleaned in the greatest way possible before every service and after every service that we have. So hopefully you'll consider that as you think about our services here in person at the building. We are in our class on the apostles this morning and we will in the regard to our class this morning we will finish uh, our segment of this class. We have been through seven different segments uh, including an introduction entitled the calling of the twelve and later on down the road in sermon form or maybe in a pop-up single class form uh, we will add an additional class to this segment. Um, it will be standalone in its own, but someone has requested 
that we go through each individual apostle and look at the miracles that they performed and the wonders that they performed in connection to their relationship with Jesus upon this earth. So at some point in time, uh, we will embark on a study on that, whether that be in sermon form or an individual pop-up class uh, that may take place. So that will happen. Uh, I'm still track. I don't know if you've ever tried to track that down, but there are just a few things that the apostles did in regard to uh, miracles and other things. So that'll take some time to develop, but we will get that together in this class. And today we will roll into what's called the seventh two, which is officially our eighth segment of this class, counting the introduction. I believe this is week 10. Two of our studies took two weeks each. And I believe this is week 10 of our class. So I appreciate you studying with me in this class. And as today, we finish out this class uh, with Matthias and Paul. And of course, as we study these two, I want you to go ahead and go to Acts chapter 1. That's where we will begin our study this morning with Matthias. And then we will look at Saul and we will look at Paul as we continue to go through our study and end there with them. Go with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Now, what we've done with every single individual that is called an apostle inside of the New Testament, we have looked at their calling, we have looked at their actions, and we have looked at their death. Now, in all of these, you've noticed this in a variety of different individuals. Uh, some, we have large amounts of information, and it takes us a, a good portion of time to go through. And others, we have very little information about them. And such is the case with Matthias this morning. Matter of fact, as you find yourself in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26, you will find the one that is called Matthias. Now, especially as you make your way down into the latter part of Acts chapter 1, you will find him in this particular scene. But as you start in Acts chapter 1, I want you to pick up with me in verse 12. Verse 12. Acts chapter 1, verse 12, picks up this way. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, one saying to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. Let me go to chapter 1, folks. That makes a lot more sense. I knew something wasn't right there in verse 12. Don't read chapter 2. You won't be where I'm supposed to be. Here, Acts chapter 1, verse 2. Oh, that's much better. There we go. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Ovlet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were all come, they went up into an upper room and abode with Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Verse 15, in these days, in these days, stood up Peter in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names were about 120. Now, pause with me just in, in, in reflection of what's taken place. What has taken place as you think to the past? What has taken place? What significant event has taken place? Okay, Jesus has ascended. Let's step back again. What happened before the ascension? All right. The ascension, you go back right next. What next happens right before the ascension? What happens right before the, right after the crucifixion? All right, there's the ascension. Jesus, remember, what happened to him? He walks out of the tomb. Before that, he was crucified. Before that was his trial. Before that was his betrayal by Judas. What happened to Judas? Well, he repented of his actions that he did toward Jesus, and then he hung himself. So you have a variety of large events that took place really in a very small portion of time. What we would call these events in the lives of those that were the apostles, in the lives of those that were mentioned here in verse 14 and verse 15, about 120 people that were gathered here. I would suggest to you that these 120 were very close to Jesus in some way. We don't know who they are. We don't know everything about them. But for some reason, they were gathered after all of these events took place. Now, you just take one of these events, and we would call them life stressors. And usually in an individual's life, we only have a number of life stressors that are major catastrophic events. 
But a large amount of events have taken place. Matter of fact, for the twelve, one of their friends, Judas, betrayed Jesus. That's a life stressor, isn't it? And in walking through that, you have Peter. What happened to Peter at the trial? Right there before the trial. He denied the Lord. So you have Peter who has a major event in his life. And everyone else seems to know these things. You have Jesus who goes to the trial. And by the way, do you remember what happened at the trial of Jesus? All the people called for who to be released? The rabbis. So the last time people voted on Jesus, they voted for the other guy. That'll play crucial in our Sunday morning sermon here in just a little bit. And Jesus was sent to the cross. And what had Jesus done to go to the cross? Nothing. Okay. Now fast forward a little bit. We, we think back to the past. Jesus had told the apostles. Jesus had told them to be in that room when the day of Pentecost was coming. Where were they? We're getting ready to be in that scene as we're reading in Acts chapter 1. And here Peter is talking to all these people. It's interesting to me that Peter stands up. But nonetheless, he's giving this reiteration of the things that take place. And verse 23 reads this way, And they appointed two. Well, what did they appoint them to? Well, we go back and they recognize. They see that the number of the twelve was eleven. So here is the adding of Matthias. They appointed two. A Joseph called Barabbas, whose name, or Barsabas, whose name was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Now look at verse 24. I want you to see this. And they prayed. Pause. With all the information that we have about Matthias, as a matter of fact, it's all right here in Acts chapter 1. We're not going to read about him again. We're going to see here in just a moment. We're not going to see major life events because we only see his name in Acts chapter 1 verse 23 and in Acts chapter 1 verse 26. But notice surrounding these men, this is what they all did as a group of people. And they prayed. Let me ask you a very important question. When is the last time that you prayed? Now, let me give a little disclaimer to my question. You can't count the prayer that we had just a minute ago. When is the last time that you prayed? I'm talking about serious things of life, okay? When's the last time you prayed about this world? I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of unrest in our world. There's a lot of people who don't know what to do in this world. Maybe you're one of the people who feel like you're not sure what you should do. Well, that's what these men were doing. They weren't sure about everything, so what did they do? They assembled to prayer. And thus, as we follow all of this out, we see that the one that was chosen was Matthias. And we find verse 26, And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. So the eleven now is... 12. And that's all we know about Matthias. That's all we know about him. We know that his beginning in the 12 started with prayer because they just weren't sure exactly what they should be dealing with in this life. When you think about his death, we don't know what exactly happened in his life, but when you think about his death, there are a number of things that take place. Uh, one historian says he was stoned. Uh, some say that he was beheaded and others say that he was crucified. If you had to pick one, which one's the lesser? Well, none of them really worked out good for Matthias, did they? So, so this is the question we've asked all the way through our study. We've asked it of the previous 12. Let's ask it of number 13. What did it cost him? His life. We've asked this, we've asked this 12 times before. Let's ask it of 13th. What does it cost us? Very little, huh? Very little. The whole purpose of this class is less about the information on the apostles and more about us. Thank you. 
That's right. I meant to mention that in the very beginning, most likely from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Matthias was one of those 70 that was sent out. So he's probably, and probably this 120 that's listed in Acts chapter 1, were very close to Jesus and were around him a number, probably a large amount of times. But yet it cost him his life. And what does it cost us? A little time. But what does that really cost? What is, what is a little time? What is four hours a week really costing you and I? You sleep more than four hours a day, most likely. You probably eat more than four hours a day. If you count three-hour periods and you count a couple of snacks, you might. Now, I'm not saying you constantly. Come on, just think about it. You sit at the table a little bit of time. You spend a lot of time getting ready in the week, don't you? How long do you think, how many hours per week do you, does it take you to get ready? I'm not talking about the whole week. Pretty good amount of time, huh? It costs us a little time to be a follower of Jesus. Let's think about that time that it cost us for just a minute, because this is the point of the class. Well, we, we came to a building that has heat and air, that has running water, has padded pews. If we need to, we can leave something here, and oh, it's here next time that when we get here... We have people that take care of us in regard to security and other means. The building is thoroughly cleaned in times such as these. What does it cost us? Well, just a little time. Not that much, huh? Maybe somebody calls us a bad name. Maybe somebody doesn't like us. What does it cost us? Very little. What did it cost them? Everything. Let's see Saul. Let's see Paul. Now, probably one of the most iconic inside of Scripture, mainly because he wrote most of the New Testament, that does tend to help, is Paul. We're going to look at him as Saul and Paul because we're going to walk through uh, significant portions of his life. And we're going to ask all the way through, we're going to do this both in our own minds, you'll have to be a participant in this, what did it cost Paul? And then at the end, we'll ask the question, what did it cost him, which we will see his demise and then we'll ask that final question, the last time we'll ask it for the 14th time. What has it cost us? Let's start off by looking at Saul by going to Acts chapter 7. Let's see the beginning, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, and I want you to notice with me verse 58. In Acts chapter 7, you have an interesting situation. Acts chapter 7, verse 58 reads this way. And cast him out of the city. Now pause with me there. Who is the him of verse 58? And cast him out of the city. Stephen, okay. And cast Stephen out of the city and stoned Stephen. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was ooh, Saul. So here we are studying this morning about Saul. We're studying about Paul, the same person. By the way, we're going to get to a point. We're just going to notice Saul and Paul, their surnames. They go together. They're interchangeable. The very first occasion that we see him in a major event, Stephen was being stoned. And what was Saul's job? He's the keeper of the coats. Now, watch what happens. Watch what happens when you surround yourself with certain lifestyles. Acts chapter 8, notice verse 1. We'll see verses 2 through 4 in just a moment. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Who was the his? Now, many people you'll study with who look at the book of Acts and study it from a historical context and a textual context will tell you that Acts chapter 8 verse 1 as we know it belongs in Acts chapter 7 as verse 61. It's a continuation. Don't look at chapter 8 and say, forget the rest, starting new, because you'll miss who and what is being talked about. And Saul was consenting unto his, Stephen's, death. At that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And 
They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. That's interesting to note, isn't it? Except the apostles. They weren't scattered for whatever reason, probably many times involving the providence of God there. They weren't scattered. They still had free course, it seems, to do what was going on in this great persecution. They were still kind of under the radar, it seems, in this great persecution. But the people, the church, they were scattered abroad. Now, let me ask you a question. This has nothing to do with Saul, nothing to do with Paul. Are, are, are we scattered yet? Have we been scattered abroad? Like we're reading about in Acts chapter 8, verse 1? Uh-uh. We are still able to assemble. We are still able to proclaim. We are still able to go. We follow Matthew 28 and 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16. We're still able to go. Let me ask you this question. As the church, we're the church, aren't we? What persecution are we facing right now? I'm talking actively dealing with. I can't come up with one, can you? I tried to, to, to try to help us be in the shoes of those in the church in the time we're reading when Stephen was stoned. I agree, I agree wholeheartedly. In, in the world, yes, there are. I, I know men who have been put into prison. I've met them face to face. I've shaken their hand. I know men who are currently in prison. Why? Because they're presenting the gospel. They stood somewhere and they opened up the Bible and they taught and, and they got arrested. I, I know places where church is not because of some medical reason, but because the government says you can't have this as the church and you're not allowed to assemble. We don't face that, but think about us. What, what are we facing right now? Very little. I want us to see these contrasts. Very little. Very little. Say that again. Well, I'll, I'll be a chump if that's what he wants me to be. Okay, here, here's what we've decided. The worst thing that's happening to us is somebody called us a name and we don't know what it means, and I just repeated it, so hopefully it's not foul. That's what we know. That's the worst that's happening to us right now. Now, I don't want it to get worse. Is anybody else? Does anybody else want it to get worse for Christians? I don't want Acts chapter 8, verse 1, in my life or my children's life. But it was, and Saul consented unto his death. And, and men, uh, devout men, carried Stephen to his barrow and made great lamentations over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Oh, my. Enter Saul on the scenes of the world. And the church is very persecuted. And what did that drive the church to do? To get busy. I'm going to say something that's going to sound a little bit conflicting to you. It is to me as well. But it seems as we study the New Testament, as we study the overview of the New Testament church as we find in Scripture, I'm not talking about us as the New Testament church because that's who we are, but as we study what's in the New Testament written in black and white, when the church is persecuted, the church grew in leaps and bounds every time. There was never a time where the church went home and turned on the television. Now, I know they didn't have the television, but you may say it a different way. They didn't go home and read a scroll. But the church was active. And you see that here. Saul enters the scene in a very pivotal moment for the church because the more they persecuted God's people, and by the way, notice this in Acts chapter 8, where did they persecute the people? As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. What is the church? Is the church a building? I don't think he's talking about a building here. Entering into every... Ooh. Anybody ever knocked on your door? Are you a Christian? If so, you need to come with me. That's the context of this passage. He didn't go to an assembly. Think about this. 
they knew who they were outside of the assembly. Is there enough evidence? Has Christianity cost us enough that someone knows that's who they are? Looking at that's who that, that's their home, they're Christians. That's what was happening here. And thus you have the real entrance of Saul who comes in as the church has really kicked in and they are prepared as you read here in verse 4. They were scattered abroad and what did they do? Went everywhere. What did they do? Preaching what? Listen, if you want to grow in your faith, you go everywhere. Isn't that a command of Jesus to go? And you teach what? The word. This is a reiteration of Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20 and Mark 16, 15 and 16. They, in the midst of persecution, go. They went. They taught the word. So here we have them. As Saul is entering in, we have a group of people who have prepared themselves to make sure that the church continues to survive. Ask yourself this question as we move to Acts chapter 9. What are you doing to ensure that the church survives? I'll leave that to you. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, pick up with me here. We'll go down to verse 4, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughterings against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired letters unto Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Pause there. We'll pick back up in verse 3. If there were any of this way. You know what that tells me about Christianity? Do you know what that tells me and you about Saul? He could look at people and he could tell what way they were going. There was evidence in their lives. And whether it was men or women, boy, isn't that interesting. Whether it was men or women, by the way, it's up to all of us to help the cause of Christ. Can you think of great men and women combos in the New Testament who taught and who were of the way? Can you name me one? They pulled a man aside and taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. Ah, Aquila and Priscilla. So here, here was a husband and wife, a man and a woman of the way who lived it in their lives. So, so we know that it's not only a one-time occasion, it's a multiple other sets of occasions. Uh, you, you go read the book of Philemon. You go read where they had these smaller house churches because buildings weren't prevalent at that time. There were husbands and wives who helped the church grow exceedingly during these times. And whoever he saw, whatever it might be, that he may bring them bound to Jerusalem. So here's what Saul was doing. He was going to other cities with letters from the high priest. And he was taking Christians out of their town and bringing them to another so that they could stand trial for their Christianity. And thus we see verse 4, really the rendering of the rest of verse 3. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who called Saul? Who called Paul? Who was it? It was Jesus. Why persecutest thou me? Who is the me? It was Jesus. Now as you continue on, you will see in Acts chapter 9, before we make it to Acts chapter 11 in just a moment, you will see that another question gets asked, verse 5. A statement is told, verse 6, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You find that as we follow down, verse 10, a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and he said unto him, and the Lord said unto him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, here am I. Verse 11. Now here's what's interesting to me about Ananias. If you'll allow me to paraphrase verse 11, Go find Saul. Well, by the way, as much as the world knew who Christians were, the Christians knew who the world was. We're living in a time where no one really knows any different. 
We're living in a time where the world and the Christian acts the same. We're living in a time where the world and Christians, they speak the same. We're living in a time where world and the world and Christians, they dress the same. We're living in a time where the world and Christians, they have the same entertainment. We're not living in a time as we're reading about right here. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, that's up to us to change. The world's not going to change it. They're not going to start acting differently from you. They're not going to act differently than me. We must be the ones who are different. We're called to be that way. And it's about time we did it so we can be people who know. So Ananias says, verse 13, Lord, I've heard, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he's done to the saints at Jerusalem. Verse 15, go thy way for he's a chosen vessel. Who chose and called Saul? It was our Lord. Now, as we follow this out, as we, we continue in, we see Saul, we see Saul as a Christian from this point forward, especially as we roll down into this chapter and we see what Saul did to become a Christian. He was baptized. You roll into chapter 11. You continue away a little bit more, and I want you to see Acts chapter 11, verse 25. Acts 11, verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Taras for to seek Saul. All right, he used to be the great persecutor of the church. He could get letters from the high priest to, to take men and women and put them into prison and, and to charge them for the crime of Christianity. And now we have men, now we have men who are seeking after Saul. Not for evil reasons, but for good reasons. You look at verse 26, once he found them, they, they made it to Antioch, and it came to pass the whole year they assembled themselves with the church, and they taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now the church is seeking after Saul. I want you to see as you roll down into verse 30, Saul continues to grow in his faith which also they did, we read back earlier, relief. They were giving relief to those in Judea and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Which, by the way, I'm not saying this is a, a prerequisite, but I'm saying it's a good thing. Anytime you send money, it's best to send it by two. Why do you think it was sent by two here? Think about this for just a minute. Name me a man who had his money or who had his hand in the bag. Think of the past. Judas. It's very wise when we deal with money issues to, to handle it with more than one. Because then there's accountability. And there's accountability here. I would suggest to you that neither of these men were looked at and thought, well, that's questionable. I'll send somebody with them. It's, it's kind of a thing to take care of. There's something to notice there. But here is Paul, or Saul, who continues to grow inside the faith. Roll into chapter 12, and I want you to notice with me verse 25. We're, we're going to go through a series of things here rather quickly. Really, I want you to read verse 24 and verse 25. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Now, let me ask you this. How does the Word of God grow? This is, a very, this is a very fundamental thing here. How does the Word of God grow? I think that's a very good way to look at it. Number one, we can recognize in the time that we're reading that the Word was penned and that the Word was spread and it grew, it multiplied in that way. So how does the Word of God grow? When we take it. When we go. Now, now listen, we are not like the apostles. We cannot pen the Word of God. But it grew because it was being spread. You'll see that in the continuation of, the, of this chapter. But look at verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So they are continuing to go through the world. And what are they doing? What is the main focus of Saul, of Paul? No matter what it cost him. By the way, let's ask the question. Let's kind of ask him, what does it cost him already? Well, Saul had to give up his official connection with the high priest. Ooh, a very powerful man in the world. 
He had to give up all the grandeur that came with that position that he had. By the way, money, prestige, anything he wanted in this life, all he had to do is speak and, and it was done. And, and now he's went to be a servant of the Savior. And what payroll did he have? What was Paul's profession? He was a tent maker. All right, he had to go making tents. What was Paul's retirement fund? Heaven. What was Paul's insurance plan? By the way, heaven also. <laughs> Do you start to see something about the apostles? As they grew, as they matured, as they became who they were, this material world faded away. Let me tell you, we have a big problem with this material world. We just want more of it. That's the American dream. right and here they were they were they were part of that and i guess we asked the question are we a part of that so we have them here he was sent by these people he was doing all these things he, he he's involved in all of these different events and we see him continuing to work in chapter 12 you move into chapter 13 go to verse 3 then saul who is also called paul filled with the holy ghost and set his eyes on him all right, question. When did Saul become Paul? When did Paul become Saul? Did Saul become Paul when he became a good guy? That's a major theory of people. When, when, did, when, when did Saul become Paul? Well, if we say that Saul became Paul because he was converted... Well, that means he was converted in Acts chapter 13, which is not true, is it? When was Saul converted? Mm. Think about something. Go all the way back. As you follow, and we'll move our PowerPoint back. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 6, when was Saul converted? Saul was not converted on the road to Damascus. Ah, see, Saul was told on the road to Damascus to go to that city, and there will be one who was there. That was Ananias. You follow this out, and you'll see it reiterated from Paul a number of other times that he was baptized after he was told what he must do. By the way, it's Jesus, verse 6, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Saul did not become Paul because all of a sudden he's a good guy, a Christian. Otherwise, it would have happened in Acts chapter 9. So why did Saul become Paul? That's right. That's right. That's right. As we see him kind of turn into this new life, and as a matter of fact, this is later on in the life that he changes the name, he becomes Paul. Both Saul and Paul. By the way, interesting. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, surname are interchangeable. How many times as we've studied the apostles have we found someone who was called this, but he's also called this? Same thing is happening here. It's not all of a sudden that Saul has become Paul because he's now the Christian that he's supposed to be. Because if that were true, everything we have looked at as we follow our outline from chapter 13 up, well, Saul was a bad guy. And that's not true. He was. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, that's right. My point is we don't know when any type of change took place. And saying that when it is changed and when it was changed, which is right here in Acts chapter 13, specifically verse 9, 
would be saying everything before that was bad or evil and everything after that was good. So just know it's an interchanged name. Sometimes we, we kind of get caught up in that sometimes. You have the name. Let's see the stand. This is in Acts chapter 13 as well. I want you to notice verse 46 because from this point on, it seems that Saul just develops greatly. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it is necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. What a stand that had to be made. So they're finally, it seems that the apostles, it seems all of those that were working in the church continue to grow bigger and more faithful to God as they continue to go through. Now, what we have is a large number of things, and we're not going to be able to look at them all. But we have, starting in Acts chapter 15, which is where we're getting ready to go, all the way down to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 to look at. So what we will probably do is we will mention the things right here in the book of Acts as we go through, and we'll turn to them as we talk about them, but we won't spend as much time with them due to unfortunate thing called time that slips away from us. Acts chapter 15, verse 12, you have Paul who is speaking and declaring the word of God, and you see his actions, he wrought miracles and other actions in front of him. In Acts chapter 16, as you find Saul, or you, as you find Paul, in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, you have Paul and Silas who prayed at midnight. You go to Acts chapter 17. I'm telling you, we're going to go through these real fast. Acts chapter 17, verse 2 specifically. You have Paul who went into the synagogues and he reasoned with them. Now listen to this. According to the, what's the next word? Scriptures. You have Paul who did this. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. I have something called the sight. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Verse 23, you have this unknown God. So he sees the things that they do. And in Acts chapter 20, as you rolled Acts chapter 20, verse 36, you have Saul, you have Paul, of which weeps because he's leaving people of whom he will never see again. So the character of Paul, the character of Saul, has become an amazing giant as he goes throughout the entire known world. Now, what you have is, is something that takes place as you continue. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, inside of verse 13, you have the attitude that comes from Paul. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Who was Paul pointing people to? Christ. It was Christ. You, you see the, re, the repeat in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. He tells them as you look in verse 4, I am, or some, one says, I am of Paul, another of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Have you not turned the church worldly, he says. So we see who he's pointing people to continually. As you go to the book of Galatians, go with me to the book of Galatians. This will be the last passage that we get to look at this morning. But you can look at Ephesians 3, 1 and see him as a prisoner. You can see him in 2 Peter 3, verse 15, as the writer. He, he had a lot of writings, and Peter mentions those writings. But see with me in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Let's see, let's see Paul. Now, now just read the, the, the first three words. Paul and apostle. That's very important for us to notice. And what we've found as we go through the life of these individuals, they sacrificed it all. So here's the question. How did he die? Well, Paul's a Roman citizen. Remember, he appealed to his Roman citizenship in his life. Matter of fact, he spent a lot of time in prison because of it, because of what he was. Because of that, he was protected from being crucified. And most likely, he was beheaded. It's not recorded in Scripture, but the general consensus is among the scholarship community is that the way that most Roman citizens, when they were put to death, was by beheading, and we see no reason to think that Paul was any different. We also know that Roman law prohibited them from crucifying him because he was a Roman citizen. So here it is, last two questions. Number one, what did it cost Paul to follow Christ? His life. Okay, for the 14th time, here it is. What has it cost you? Remember, this is our answer. Very little. So you see this study that we've been in has really been less about the apostles and more about you. 
Because I want you to see that as we're in just an interesting age, living for Christ is the priority. And though it's not cost you anything yet, and I hope it never does, but it might. And there you have the 14 who are listed in the New Testament as apostles. Thank you so much for participating with me in this class. What we will do next Sunday as we start, uh, we will begin a new class which will be on the life of Christ. We're doing something very specific in our classes right now uh, since we're all combined in a, a large group both on Wednesdays and Sundays. Uh, from the very time when we were back online even to the present and into the foreseeable future, we will continue to do this. But we will theme our classes on ways that we can be faithful. That's why we studied the book of Daniel. That's why we studied the doctrine series. That's why we're looking um, the back to the start series. That's why we're looking at the doctrine series. That's why we're going to look at the life of Christ because we need to find a way to associate Jesus with faithfulness as we face our current life. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.